listening part of the occupational English test has three parts and in each part you hear a number of different extracts. At the beginning of the test you will hear a beep sound. You have time to read the questions before you hear the extracts. You will hear each extract once only. You have to complete your answers as you listen. At the end of each test you will be given two minutes to check your answers. Part A. In this part of the test you hear two different extracts. In each extract a health professional is talking to her patient. For questions 1 to 24, complete the notes with the information you hear. Now, look at the notes for extract 1. Extract 1, questions 1 to 12. You hear a doctor talking to a patient called Metagal. For questions 1 to 12, complete the following notes with a word or short phrase. You now have 30 seconds to look at the notes. Good morning, Doctor. Good morning. Please be seated. Can you tell me about your problem? Doctor, since last year, I've been having double vision whenever I wake up in the morning. The problem lasts for one hour after I wake. When I close my eyes, the double vision dissipates. Over the past month, the double vision problem has worsened in intensity and frequency. I approached a local hospital in my town, and they referred me to the emergency department for an urgent MRI to investigate for possible aneurysm. There, I had a normal MRI and I was discharged to go home. By the next week, the double vision improved, although at present, I'm still experiencing constant diplopia. In the past, whenever I saw two objects, they were very far apart in horizontal plane, but now the objects appear much closer together. I've stopped driving. I've also discontinued my job due to the diplopia problem. There's no temporal fluctuation to the double vision. Very recently, over the past week, I've developed supraorbital pain on the right side. Your age? 51, Doctor. Do you have any problems with swallowing or dysphagia? No, Doctor. Any weakness, numbness, tingling, or any neurological issues? No, Doctor. Do you have any difficulty in speaking or dysarthria? No, Doctor. Are you on any medication or allergic to any medicines? No, Doctor. Do you drink or smoke? I do not drink. But I smoke. Is there any family history of any illness? My mother died of a stroke when she was 90. My father had colon cancer. Well, your physical examination report shows your BP 124 over 76, heart rate 101, respiratory rate is 20. Your recent MRI report shows a questionable 3 mm aneurysm of the medial left supraclinoid internal corduroy artery. There is absolutely no abnormality on the right side. The blood flow patterns are normal and there is no blood vessel abnormalities. I think you have developed a condition myasthenia gravas or other disorder. Your right lid process. You have left gaze diplopia. The pupils are equal and reactive to light. Your neurological investigation is absolutely normal. There are possibilities of other extraocular abnormalities. You have horizontal diplopia in both directions, but there is no vertical diplopia. You have monocular diplopia. Is it curable, Doctor? Yes, of course. I would advise you to have a craniotomy and clipping done. This is a surgery performed to treat an aneurysm. However, you have to be very careful after the surgery because a rupture may cause you to lose your vision. I think I should go for this surgery at any cost, Doctor. You are right, Mr. Metagle. Extract 2, questions 13 to 24. 
You hear a physician talking to a patient called Mr. Medhigu. The questions 13 to 24 complete the following notes with a word or short phrase. You now have 30 seconds to look at the notes. Good morning, Mr. Mahigu. Be seated. Tell me about your problem. Doctor, I wanted re-evaluation of possible idiopathic normal pressure hydrocephalus. OK. What's your age now? I'm 80, Doctor. May I know when and how you developed this illness? Well, it started 12 months ago. I had severe cognitive impairment, gait impairment and incontinence. Actually, I was evaluated in hospital at the time with CSF drainage via temporary spinal catheter but there wasn't any significant response for that. Well, your MRI shows you have cervical stenosis. It seems you also had a cervical laminectomy and instrumental fusion six months back. Yeah, but there's no significant improvement. I think I've become worse now than I was a year ago. Practically, I'm unable to walk at all. I use both a walker and a support from an assistant to be able to walk or stand. Do you have any headaches? No, Doctor. I think my memory has worsened. What medication are you taking? I recept 10 milligrams in the evening, carbidopa 25 milligrams or levodopa 100 milligrams three times a day, cytolopram 40 milligrams daily, colus 100 milligrams twice a day, phenosteride 5 milligrams once a day, Flomax 0.4 milligrams once a day, multivitamin with iron once a day, omeprazole 20 milligrams once a day, senna 8.6 milligrams twice a day, Tylenol 650 milligrams as needed, and Promethazine 25 milligrams as needed. Your cranial nerve exam shows there is no upgaze that I can extract today. The down gaze and horizontal gaze are intact. Your gait is severely impaired. I have reviewed your CT scan of your brain and compared it to the MRI scan taken eight months ago. Now I can see that the ventricles appear larger. The frontal hall span was previously about 5.5 centimetres, and now it is 6 centimetres. The third ventricular span is 15 millimetres. I have come to the conclusion now that you have idiopathic normal pressure hydrocephalus. There is a possibility of supranuclear palsy, incontinence and urinary urgency. Although you have already had a CSF drainage via spinal catheter a year ago, I would strongly recommend that you repeat this now because there is further enlargement of the ventricles on the scan. I would also recommend a shunt surgery that would probably make a difference. This is the end of part A. Now look at part B. Part B. In this part of the test, you will hear six different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear people talking in a different healthcare environment. For examples 25 to 30, choose the best answer, A, B, or C, which fits best according to what you hear. For you will have time to read each question before you listen to the audio. Complete the answers as you listen to the audio. Now look at question 25. You hear a discussion between two doctors about the complications which are expected at a later stage following heart attack. Hello doctor, what types of complications are expected at a later stage following a heart attack? 
Well, there are certain complications that arise at a later stage following heart attack. In the condition called aneurysm, a scar tissue builds up on the damaged heart wall, resulting in blood clots, low blood pressure, and abnormal heart rhythms. In the condition called pericarditis, the lining of the heart becomes inflamed, causing serious chest pain. Angina occurs when there is not adequate oxygen to reach to the heart, causing chest pain. During congestive heart failure, the heart beats very weakly, leaving a person feeling exhausted and breathless. In the condition called edema, fluid accumulates in the legs and ankles, causing them to swell. Loss of erectile function is caused by a vascular problem. Loss of libido or loss of sexual drive happens, especially in the case of men. Question 26. You hear a discussion between a doctor and a nurse about uterine fibroids. Hello, doctor. What are uterine fibroids? Well, uterine fibroids are benign tumors that may grow in various parts of the uterus of a woman. Intramural fibroids are the most common type of fibroid that appear within the muscular wall of the uterus. Intramural fibroids can grow larger and stretch the womb. Subserosal fibroids form on the outside of the uterus called the serosa and may grow large enough to make the womb appear bigger on one side. Submucosal fibroids bulge into the uterine cavity. Pendunculated fibroids are attached to the uterine wall by a stalk-like growth called a penduncle, which is the main difference between pendunculated fibroids and other fibroids. If a pendunculated fibroid forms in the middle muscle layer or myometrium of the uterus, then it is called pendunculated submucosal fibroid. And if it forms outside the uterus, it is called a pendunculated subserosal fibroid. Question 27. You hear a discussion between a doctor and a nurse about acquired digital fibrocuritoma. Hello, doctor. What is acquired digital fibrokeratoma? Well, an acquired digital fibrokeratoma is a benign tumor usually occurring on the fingers and toes, which is an uncommon condition often seen in middle-aged people. Usually the tumors have a dome-shaped appearance, but can also look like elongated projections in some cases. Acquired digital fibrokeratoma lesions are usually isolated but are also associated with other tumors, in very rare cases. A type 1 acquired digital fibrocuritoma lesion is dome-shaped and has a dermal core that is made up of a thick, intertwined bundles of collagen, which are typically oriented along the lesion's vertical axis. There are numerous capillaries, thin elastic fibers, and fibroblasts between the bundles of collagen. The type 2 acquired digital fibrocuritoma lesions are less common. Although they appear similar to type 1 tumors, histologically they are typically tall and also have a considerably higher number of fibroblasts and fewer elastic fibers. A type 3 acquired digital fibrocuritoma is very rare and the tumors are fluid filled and have fewer elastic fibers. The lesions can be flat to dome shaped. Question 28. You hear a discussion between a doctor and a nurse about pelvic organ prolapse. Doctor, what is pelvic organ prolapse? Well, pelvic organ prolapse refers to the condition in which one or more of the pelvic organs suffers descent from their normal position in the pelvis. It may be congenital or acquired defect 
or weakness in the normal pelvic supporting structures. The anatomical categorization describes which organ is primarily involved in the descent. Urethrocell involves the anterior vaginal wall and urethra descend into the vaginal opening. Cystocell involves descent of the anterior vaginal wall and bladder. Cystourethrocell involves the prolapse of the bladder and urethra along the anterior vaginal wall. Uterovaginal prolapse involves the descent of the uterus, the cervix, and the vaginal vault. Enterocell prolapse of the posterior uppermost part of the vagina with loops of small intestine that have accumulated inside. Rectocell involves descent of the lower posterior wall of the vagina and the rectum which bulges into it. Question 29. You hear a discussion about hematuria. Hello, doctor. What is hematuria? Well, hematuria is a health condition that is identified by the presence of blood in the urine. Microscopic and macroscopic are the two major classifications of hematuria. The different types of hematuria categorized based on the cause are Infective hematuria is caused due to pyelonephritis, cystitis, or urethritis. Stones-related hematuria is caused due to staghorn calculi, calcium stones, or uric acid stones. Trauma-related hematuria is caused due to pelvic trauma, renal injuries, or foreign bodies. Renal hematuria is caused due to immunoglobulin A nephropathy, hereditary nephritis, medullary sponge kidney, or thin basement membrane diseases. Latrogenic hematuria is caused due to recent endoscopic procedure, transrectal ultrasound, traumatic catheterization, radiation, indwelling ureteric stents, renal biopsy, extracorporeal shockwave lithotripsy. Benign hematuria is caused due to strictures, renal masses, or benign prostatic hypertrophy. Malignant hematuria is caused due to prostate acinar adenocarcinoma, or renal cell, transitional cell, squamous cell, or urothelial cell carcinoma. Question 30. You hear a discussion about types of collagen and associated disorders. Doctor, can you explain different types of collagen and associated disorders? Well, there are about 29 genetically distinct collagens present in animal tissues. Collagen types 1, 2, 3, 5, and 11 self-assemble into D-periodic cross-striated fibrils. Here, the D is about 67 nanometers, and there is characteristic axial paradosity of collagen. Type 1 collagen is found throughout the body, except in cartilaginous tissues. It is the main component of bone. It is also synthesized in response to injury and in fibrous nodules and fibrous diseases. Type 2 collagen is the main component of cartilage. It is also found in developing cornea and vitreous humor. These are formed from two or more collagens or copolymers rather than a single type of collagen. Type 3 collagen is found in the walls of arteries and other hollow organs and usually occurs in the same fibril with type 1 collagen. Type 4 forms the basis of cell basement membrane. Type 5 collagen and type 11 collagen are minor components of tissue and occur as fibrils with type 1 and type 2 collagen respectively. Type 5 forms cell surfaces, hair, and placenta.
That is the end of part B. Now look at part C. Part C. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear health professionals talking about specific aspects of their work. For questions 31 to 42, choose the answer A, B, or C, which fits best according to what you hear. Complete the answers as you listen to the audio. Now look at extract 1. Extract 1, questions 31 to 36. You hear the discussion between a senior doctor and junior doctors about vovulvas. You have 90 seconds to read questions 31 to 36. Hello everybody. I am going to explain to you about vulvulvus. The word vulvulvus is derived from the Latin term. It is a subtype of abnormal gastrointestinal rotation. In vulvulvus, a loop of intestines is twisted at a point along the mesentery, attached to the gastrointestinal tract. Vulvulvus may result in bowel obstruction that is considered as a medical emergency. Because there is not a blockage, but there is also a compromised vascular supply to the gut. There are four primary mesenteries found within the abdomen, and as a result of it, there are, there are four corresponding primary types of vulvulvus, gastric, midgut, cecal, and sigmoid vulvulvi. Gastric vulvulvus occurs when our stomach twists at least 180 degrees around its mesentery, resulting in obstruction of the bowel. Patients with gastric vulvulvus may be present with Borchardt's triad, which are spontaneous and severe epigastric pain, uncontrolled producing vomiting, noises without a vomit, due to the impossibility of passing a nasogastric tube through to the gut. There are two subcategories of gastric vulvulvus. Organoaxial vulvulvus tends to occur after traumatic events or hernia of the periesophageal area. The stomach rotates along its long axis that is along the path between the pylorus and the cardia. This condition is usually symptomatic when the rotation is more than 180 degrees and causes ischemia in addition to obstruction. Mesenteroaxial vulvulvus tends to occur very frequently in children. The rotation of the stomach along its short axis, that is along that path perpendicular to organoaxial, or the pathway between the lesser and greater curvatures of the stomach. The treatment of gastric vulvulvus which may involve an emergency laparotomy, insertion of gastronomy, percutaneous tube, and hernia and diaphragmatic damage repair. The surgery is primarily aimed to reduce the degree of twisting and prevent any chances of recurrence while taking care of factors that create a predisposition. Midgut vulvulvus begins in newborn with sudden bilis vomiting. In addition, the abdomen becomes tender as it fills with fluid that accumulates within the bowel lumen and followed by inflammation of the peritoneum and shock. Patients with midgut vulvulvus typically have a corkscrew sign visible on fluoroscopy contrast examination, which is a spiral appearance of the bowel. Another imaging technique, such as ultrasound and computed tomography, show a whirlpool sign, which is used to denote twisting of the bowel on itself. A LAD surgical procedure is done to treat midgut vulvulvus which entails dividing the tissue that creates an attachment between the cecum and the abdominal wall called lad's bands, widening the mesentery of the small intestines, removal of the appendix and proper placing of the colon and cecum. 
Patients with sigmoidal volvulvus often have abdominal bloating, constipation, and nausea that may or may not be accompanied by vomiting. Sigmoidal volvulvus is considered to be associated with neurological pathologies such as multiple sclerosis and Parkinson's disease. The causes of sigmoidal volvulvus include the South American Chaga disease, laxative use, and diets rich in fiber. A whirlpool sign is also seen in sigmoidal volvulvus on imaging. In addition, a coffee bean sign may be seen on the abdominal x-ray that will look like an inner tube that is bent. In most of the cases, the insertion of a rectal tube is found to be successful in treating sigmoidal volvulvus. Cal volvuli are predominantly associated with two predisposing factors, lack of thorough peritoneal fixation and fulcrums such as abdominal masses or adhesions. Patients with cecal volvulvi tend to have distended abdomens in addition to colicky abdominal pain and vomiting. Nearly half of the patients with cecal volvulvi tend to have a cecum that is abnormally rotated in an axial plane while the remainder have a cecum that inverts in addition to twisting. Treating cecal volvuli may involve laparotomy, hemicolectomy, or cecostomy. Now look at extract 2. Questions 37 to 42. You hear the discussion of a physician with junior doctors on refractive error. You have 90 seconds to read questions 37 to 42. Hello doctor, what is refractive error and what are the types of refractive error? Well, a refractive disorder is an ocular condition caused by changes in the eye shape that prevents light from being focused sharply on the retina, creating vague images. The causes may range from congenital shortening or lengthening of the eyeball through variations in the shape of the cornea to anomalies of the lens. During the process of refraction, the light bends when passing through the cornea and the lens. This helps direct light from the objects we view exactly on the macula, the part of the retina that has the maximum number of cone cells, which 
are the photoreceptors responsible for detailed and sharp vision. Myopia or short-sightedness happens when the eye refracts light so much that the rays converge to a spot in the front of the retina, leading to a blurred image when one looks at objects that are beyond a certain distance. However, objects that are close can be seen clearly, as the light rays are divergent at their origin and so undergo the right amount of refraction. The eyeball in such people may be too long, or the cornea may be bulged more than usual, leading to the focusing of light before it reaches the retina. The condition is usually diagnosed in childhood, between 8 and 12 years. It stabilizes in the years between 20 and 40 in most cases. A family history of myopia may predispose to the condition. It is correctable using prescription eyeglasses, contact lenses, or refractive surgery such as, carot such as keratoplasty. People with high myopia have a greater risk of future retinal detachment. Hypermetropia is also called long-sightedness that occurs when light rays reflect too little and so focus beyond the retina, leading to poor vision for near objects. However, light from more distant objects is parallel and so usually comes to a focus at the retina with this lower level of refraction. Some hyperopic people cannot see well regardless of the distance of the object. The eyeball may be shorter or the cornea flatter than usual or the lens may have less refractive power than is normal. Like myopia, eyeglasses, contact lenses, or surgery may be recommended for correction. Astigmatism is a condition in which the shape of the cornea is uneven. For example, it may be curved more in one direction than the other or show areas where different curvatures. As a result, light rays are scattered and come to focus at different spots on the retina rather than forming a single sharp image. This leads to blurry vision. Eyeglasses are usually recommended, but contact lenses to smooth the refractive surface and refractive surgery to chisel the cornea to a smooth contour may also work well. Presbyopia is a refractive error caused due to aging. As the lens inside the eye ages, it loses its power to change shape with the pull of the ciliary muscles in response to the need for greater or less refractive capability. As a result, it becomes less able to accommodate itself so as to focus light from nearby objects clearly. Near vision becomes a problem, leading to the characteristic picture of people over the age of 35 or 40 holding books farther away than usually in order to see them clearly. Eyeglasses are the best way to correct presbyopia. Bifocal glasses have two different refractive powers, with the lower part being designed for reading and the upper part designed for distant vision. This is the end of part C. You now have two minutes to check your answers.